on the constitution. Mm. Basically, I'm looking at it from a cultural point of view. Mm. They say there's no term or word in the local language. Mm. It's like Uganda or might be any other language that mm. that really is, uh, sums up the word constitution. Mm. Maybe in Uganda there's Pindamateka or something of that kind. But I, basically, it's, it was like introduced in the, 19, in the 1990s. Mm. So what has been your experience I mean, with uh, working with Ugandans that do not understand or know the constitution. Mm. Yes. Well, I think it is certainly not true that the local languages don't have a word for constitution. Constitution is about laws that govern society. At least in my tribe, we had local words for laws and constitutions. Um, so I think that the concept of laws governing society has been with our African communities for time immemorial. African communities had laws, had, had, had processes. What perhaps might be a, an alien concept is the concept of constitutionalism, the culture of constitutionalism that comes with Western concepts of law, Western concepts of human rights, Western concepts of governance. That is what is alien to the African communities. But the idea of laws governing society, the, the idea of you know, institutions to enforce those laws is absolutely ingrained in every fabric of any African society, at least the ones I know. So constitutions, perhaps the form it took was not some written document, was not some... Uh, some form of code, but that were unwritten and existed in practices and customs. So the difference with modern day constitutions is that they are codified, you know, they are a set of rules that are in a book you can open and find. But in African traditional societies, rules and laws that govern society were, were ingrained in people's lifestyle, you know, people's processes in life. It was more a cultural, a cultural idea as opposed to a book that you can hold into your hand. Yeah, so uh, have you interacted with people who do not know the constitution? I say, because I'm pretty much sure that very many Ugandans who have no clue what Article 1 of the constitution says or anything, any article in the constitution. Mm. Have you had a situation where you've actually inter interacted with a Ugandan who has no idea mm. what the constitution states? I mean, several people in this country have no idea about what is contained in our constitution. They have an idea that there is a constitution somewhere, but they really have no knowledge at all about the articles of the constitution or the wording and spirit of our constitution. There are several people in this country. In fact, over the last two years, what I've been doing is giving out free copies of the Ugandan constitution. I think I have four left. You know, if I meet people who haven't understood the constitution, who don't know about it, I give you a brand new constitution in English. The challenge is that many of our people are illiterate, and then these things are in English, so they just can't understand. Uh, I think the government has failed to translate the constitution into local languages. Okay. So the people who would otherwise understand these things in their own dialect, cannot really get hold of it. Uh, and, and, and therefore, constitutional illiteracy in this country is, is extremely, extremely high. But also because the teaching of civic education in schools, that concept as a whole has disappeared. We, we don't teach constitutions to our kids in school. What we do is, during elections, provide a voter education. That's very limited. And so people don't know the constitution. It remains a document for a few, a document for the elite, and the preserve really of lawyers and those who go to court. Okay. In your own view, what is the best way to follow in order to outreach constitutionalism and respect the constitution within the minds of Ugandans? The concept of constitutionalism is not just a paper concept. It's a culture. It's a norm. It is built over time. The culture is built up until a stage where everybody respects this document called the Constitution. So for me, the first and foremost thing we need to do is change the cultural mindset. 
our perception of governance as a public good as opposed to a private good, as a means of self-aggrandizement, but as, but as a means of public good, public service. You know, people think governance is about personal aggrandizement, personal advancement. I think we've got to change that and make governance relevant to the lives of the people in this country. Because governance is about roads, it's about schools, it's about hospitals, it's about providing the basic social services to the people in the country, for them to feel that the govern, I mean, government exists and there's governance in this country. It's much more than just seeing a policeman, much more than just seeing soldiers or seeing a, you know, an RDC. Governance is about the presence of that government in the lives of the people in providing services. And we've, so we've got to make governance relevant to our people. I think also at a very secondary level, I think we've got to begin to teach our people the importance of of, of, of learning about your country, having a duty to your country. Really, civic education for me is the way to go. We've got to tell people to know the coat of arms because if I ask you what features are contained in the 50,000 shillings note, I'm sure you don't even know. So we've got to make civic education and literacy a core ingredient of our education system for us to be able to have uh, the culture of constitutionalism and, um, and, and, and entrenched in our country. Is, we, we talk about culture and constitutionalism. I think um, exactly. So, like you say, in the culture, the I mean, the traditional society, mm. there were laws. Mm. But don't you think one reason why many Ugandans do not associate with the constitution or have no idea is because the laws that govern society then, the laws that are, the laws that our forefathers knew, are not the laws that are mm. in the constitution. Like it was basically the copy and paste, which is basically what m many gov governments do is look out in the Western world and see the laws that would apply to us mm. and then, you know, come up with this book called the Constitution. Mm. Well, what, what's your view on that? Well, there, there's definitely been a cultural revolution uh, since 1962 in our country. In much, in, in much the extent that African traditional values and systems are seen as a cake, are seen as re retrogressive, are seen as backward, and has definitely been pushed away from mainstream constitutional issues. Um, I think the last document on the continent that captures the African concept of justice, African concept of rule of law, perhaps is the African Charter because it was drawn far back. Many of the African countries and their constitutions seem to have adopted a Western justice system. Now. That has come with a cultural revolution. You know, I think we're at a stage where now it is difficult to have an African identity in terms of the rule of law, to have an African identity in terms of constitutions. What perhaps needs to be done, in my view, is um, a fusion of the two systems. And I think in many respects that is being done, but only in regards to post-conflict you know, northern Uganda and perhaps in Karamoja where African concepts of justice have become an important point of resort to resolve conflict. My view is that that can be replicated across the country if you are to have a constitution that reflects the aspirations and wishes of the indigenous local Ugandan. In your own words, what would you say is the difference between the constitution, let's say constitutionalism as a concept, and the rule of law? You know, like, basically, uh, many MPs um, quote the constitution mm. to justify their actions. Mm. Even the president on several occasions has done that. Mm. What would you say is the difference between the rule of law and the constitution, and constitutionalism as a concept? The, the enthusiasm and hope that came along with the 1995 constitution has most definitely faded, has most definitely been whittled away simply because our actions have not been in accordance with the spirit of the constitution, either in terms of willful disregard of the constitution or attempts to manipulate it and amend it to suit individual interest. Exactly. That is true and that definitely has defined post-1995 constitution in Uganda. And, and therefore, uh, what we have is less respect for the rule of law, but more allegiance to political inclinations and personal uh, agenda. 
So I think that the constitution is in danger of becoming a worthless piece of paper if we do not revert to the spirit of the framers of our constitution 1995. We're going to see constitutions amended at will. We're going to see constitutions disregarded by people who are supposed to respect them. I think what we need to do is summon that will to go back to uh, respecting the will, the spirit, and the wishes of the framers of our constitution. That's one more question. In your view, you mentioned something about 1995 constitution. Mm. In your own view, why is the 1995 constitution worth more than a paper? It's written on. You see, you've got to look at the processes leading up to the promulgation of the constitution. That process was, in my view, the only process in post-independent Uganda that gave us a national consensus. A, co a, a constitutional commission was put in place to go around this country to carry out consultations with people with a view of drafting a constitution. So that constitution represented a national consensus. For the first time in post-independent Uganda, that was the most consultative process of enacting the constitution. That constitution was also enacted by a constituent assembly that was elected from across this country. So it did represent a political, social and economic consensus of this country post-independence in much an extensive way than we had ever seen before. And therefore, that was an important document. Now, that constitution was also hailed by many scholars within the country and without the country for being a progressive document. So in terms of the history, in terms of the process, in terms of the input of the ordinary Ugandan in this constitution, it is one single constitution in post-independent Uganda that represent the wishes and aspirations of at least the widest number of people in this country. So it is therefore an important document. Now, whether or not that importance is appreciated by those in power is a different question because I think that over time we've, we've seen a departure from that, that commitment, either through the appointment of the Chief Justice, the amendment of term limits to give the President more power, whether it is in issues of natural resources, that process of increasingly nibbling away at the edges of this document is, 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 is a continuing process that threatens to make this constitution a worthless piece of paper. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, so um, my questions on the